Hello, and welcome to another live stream, Industry Insights from Veeam Software. I'm Dave Russell, here with always my colleague, Jason Buffington. And today we're gonna to go through a topic around cloud and data protection, what we see happening in the field today, and a bit of a decision framework that people can utilize for their thoughts around cloud. Isn't that right, Jason? Absolutely. You know, we've been talking about the cloud um, for a lot of uh, a lot of years, and in fact, uh, you'll hear that emphasis change in my voice when we talk to customers and partners about how they're thinking about modernizing IT. They talk about, well, we're going to start using the cloud, and there's not the cloud, right? So first and foremost, recognize that the cloud is, is predominantly a consumption deployment model. It's not a thing on its own, right? But then when you talk about data protection, there's arguably my, by my count, at least six different clouds or types of cloud services that can help affect or accelerate a data protection strategy. So this framework is something that I've shared for years with folks, and it just seemed apropos, especially for all of the IT pros out there that frankly are still in their pajamas and not yet back in the data centers and looking at different kinds of IT modernization projects. Let's talk about how to use the cloud um, for data protection. Uh, and so if we could, might bring up that first slide, I think the first thing that, um, that I would offer to folks is try to understand what is it that you're trying to solve for, right? right. So this is a flow chart we're going to talk through. But for a lot of organizations, the, their first foray into cloud-based data protection or cloud-enhanced data protection, probably is a better way to say it, is just frankly get your data out of the building. Right. You know, regard. I mean, if you were using tape and paying for some guy in a white band to come lose your tapes for you. Right. Or you're shuttling them off yourself or whatever it happens to be. Just get your data out of the building, because for for at least a minimum level of DR and data survivability, you know, at least at least uh, uh, separate that attack pattern. And today you can do that with a credit card and a P.O. And the power of a reliable internet connection, which Dave sounds like you don't have as good a real internet connection today. We've got a little bit of static on your line, but um, but just get your data out of the building. And to do that, just adding cloud-based storage to your on-premise data protection solution is absolutely a no-brainer. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned or highlight two, two key things just right off the bat here, Jason. I think it's what kind of expenditure model do you wanna have you know, is it CapEx or is it OpEx? And what in this day and age in particular can you deploy so that you can satisfy the long industry standard rule of three, two, one, and sometimes we add other things onto that, but sure. three or more copies of your data on two or more pieces of media and the one, you know, one of which is offsite such that you can survive localized vulnerabilities. Now, in the in uh, normally we try to do all of the industry unbiased language up front and then we kind of do the Vimi part towards the end. In this case, it probably makes more sense to just to kind of drop a nugget or two that's a little bit more Vimi green along the way. Um, for um, for those that are out there today, certainly that's a combination of uh, of uh, cloud tier, which is built into the backup product, which allows you to use S3 storage or Azure Blob or IBM Cloud, et cetera, or um, Cloud Connect, which then enables you to leverage um, the backup as a service provider community and all of the Veeam partners that are out there as well. So you have two ways to get your data out of the building, right? Now, that's if you're just trying to solve CapEx, OpEx, you're just trying to, 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 to move data as a repository. If we click on that chart, you'll see the next question to ask yourself is, Instead of just getting your data out of the building, are you trying to improve your data protection infrastructure and or, and I like this part best, are you trying to improve the expertise and, and basically put a smarter human in charge of your data protection infrastructure than just you? And for that, it's not about cloud-based storage. It's really about backup as a service. And um, well, Dave, you, you work a lot with our partners along the way. So what are you seeing from an appetite around backup as a service these days? Yeah, I think it's very much on the rise and it, it can vary you know, by geography, meaning what country you're in. It certainly can vary by the size of your organization, particularly in the current times that we find ourselves in. The IT staff may be very busy trying to keep the lights on or run the business and in this particular moment would choose to vend out or I don't even like saying vend out or use something as a service. It's more to where you were coming at 
import expertise into your organization because you still have to have oversight for what someone's doing. But I think we're seeing a rise on this. And when we get to some some stats towards the very end here, I think we'll see that bear out. Yeah, I think the thing that that I hope people at home are hearing when we talk about leveraging a service provider as part of a data protection solution, folks tend to focus on the provider part of things, meaning that I just need to get my data out of the building as if it was analogous to cloud-based storage. That's actually not the part which is exciting. The part that's exciting is not the provider part, it's the service part, right? Because you as an IT professional or as an IT leader, you may only see an anomaly within your data protection solution once a month, once every other month. Meanwhile, the um, backup as a service professionals, they see these anomalies every day, myriad times throughout the day. They know exactly how to address those kind of things. Literally, it is about having a smarter human manage your data protection infrastructure. It's not just about getting your data out of the building for its own sake. Now, in a, both cases though, we're still talking about backup as the primary verb, right? Whether it's ma- where the self-managed, or whether it's as provider managed, it's still backup. Um, what I one of these days I will get someone in Dean Marketing to print some T-shirts for me that says "Why Baz when you can Draz?" Right. So if we go to that third slide, um, the difference between either cloud-based storage or backup as a service is you're still pretty much in charge of how that recovery process goes. But the behavior is you're going to pull that data from that cloud back on prem. With DR as a service, that's not true. And instead of bringing that data back, you're just going to light it up and reconnect the users. It's important to recognize, though, and we have another segment planned later this summer around disaster recovery for its own sake. In real disaster recovery, don't just think about the whole data center is down. If you have a server that went offline and you could power up that server as a VM in Azure AWS, do that, right? You don't have to wait for a whole scale disaster. A server down, call that a little disaster, bring it up in a, in a DRAS provider and keep on going. So, and you can get there by the way from either cloud storage or backup as a service. But again, be mindful of what you're trying to solve for. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the, the, um, the, the tactical and the operational side of things, but these are all about enhancing your on-premise data protection scenarios by leveraging the cloud as an augmentation of that. Certainly what we've seen over the last couple of years, in fact, if you look back a couple of weeks on one of the earlier streams, we talked a lot about modernization of production going to a cloud as well. So if we click on that next slide, we can kind of look at if you're, if you decide that you're going to embrace production um, uh, uh, cloud-based services, you actually have another question to ask, and that is, are you going to embracing SaaS or are you going to be embracing applications and traditional workloads now in a cloud hosted environment? If we talk about SaaS for a minute, certainly the poster child for that is Office 365. And anytime that you modernize production, you have to modernize production. And we have a story for that, don't we, Dave? Yeah, and I always like your phrase on that. You know, if you modernize upfront meaning production or something that's closer to customer facing, let's make sure we also take in availability and account for that part and parcel. So, you know, I kind of like in potentially the middle step there, the VMs or apps, some organizations are in a lift and shift, whereas some are outright saying, you know, let's change the model. We're gonna move to your example of on-prem exchange to O365. I'm just gonna pause here while I'm fresh in my mind. See Helen has a comment around what are the trends showing for DRAS, disaster recovery as a service, compared with self-managed? And that's actually, Helen, we're going to show you some real data that we have on that towards the end of this, where if you've seen some of the previous streams, we had 1,550 organizations we surveyed globally that commented on that. So hang mm-hmm. tight. That's a great question. We're going to make sure we get, get that up in short order. Yeah, I'm a BCDR nut, so we absolutely have time for that, Helen. So it's it's uh, give us like eight minutes, and we'll be right there. Um, the the thing that that and we've talked a little bit about this before, but it, it keeps bearing repeating because there's different organizations that just haven't heard it, and that is is that when you go from say on premise exchange to um, a cloud hosted Office 365, you actually solve one of the primary scenarios of data protection, which is ensuring user productivity. And so SaaS, especially Office 365, is natively durable. 
right? So if your mail doesn't come from Redmond, Washington, it comes from Arizona, it comes from Dublin, Ireland, you still get your mail, right? Or your OneDrive or your SharePoint, et cetera. That does not absolve you of the requirements of retention and uh, 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 and previous versions. This goes back to that 321 rule, right? So when you upgrade Office 365, you still need to then adapt your protection strategy um, to go along with that. And frankly, um, uh, so I, I run Office 365 even for my own stuff. I know Veeam does as well. Uh, you could spin up Veeam backup for Office 365 and actually run that in Azure. I actually run the VPO product in my Dallas, Texas home office because if my mail is in Office 365 and something were to go bad, um, I want to have at least one copy of that data that I can locally touch. So I actually back that up from the cloud back on-prem as part of my solution. So it depends on what your compliance and retention goals are. But uh, but yes, when you modernize production, you got to modernize protection. Dave, anything you want to add on that or shall we jump forward? Yeah, two quick things. And I want, you want, want to be mindful of time and get to Helen's uh, question. But two quick things there, you know, What's interesting around O365 is it is arguably the only, or one of the few, but probably one of the only SaaS applications to which you can do what you just pointed to, which is if you have the data, you can actually go touch it or you can get the application stood up yourself to be right. able to get access to it. You know, Salesforce, you could surgically go in and get a customer record, but it's not the situation where you could be fully up and operational and everyone would be be able to access their CRM data. The other thing I think is really important about your notion on durability is, yes, even in O365, absolutely the infrastructure is going to be durable or available. The application likely will be as well, but data management, data governance, that's really up to the data owner, in which case oh, yeah. in your example, you were citing why you take specific steps. You know, It doesn't absolve you when you go to SaaS for proper oversight. So with That's that, exactly let's go right. to the, the next slide. Let's click one more if we could. Yeah, so take us through this, Jason. This is interesting. So I, the, the last part of the scenario is, let's say that you're modernizing the cloud as an infrastructure, not as an application layer. So instead of running my VMs or running my server workloads on-prem, physical or virtual, I want to now run those through Azure-hosted VMs or AWS-hosted VMs. Well, Still VMs, they're still traditional workloads. That means they have all the nuances of OSs running inside of each guest OS, applications running on top of those. And just like you mentioned before, Dave, just because you go to a cloud does not absolve you of the long-term retention, the separation of duties, role-based access, data management, all those responsibilities that you have. So even though we now have IaaS hosted VMs, and frankly speaking, VMs running in Azure and AWS probably are a little bit more durable than the VMs running on VMware and Hyper-V and uh, on-prem, just because that hyperscale provider knows how to run infrastructure at scale with a little bit of extra durability built in. But you still got to back it up, right? You still got to do DR of that data. So if you have a problem from a, from a, a region or operating zone perspective, you got to be able to fail over for that. So that's why you see that arrow going over the right-hand side where DR still is part of that equation. And then the other thing that I would double back on moving all the way back to the left is just because you've modernized production um, and now you're running VMs in the cloud, all of the other choices that we had earlier on how are you going to do data protection for that? Well, okay, so how am I going to store that data? That's cloud-based storage of those VMs that are hosted now. Um, uh, doing BAS of, uh, of hosted infrastructure actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of organizations because, again, what you should be leveraging in BAS is the expertise, not just the outcomes. And then if you close that circle and make that complete loop, um, I'll put my Veeam hat back on for a second again. Veeam back up for Azure being back up for AWS and actually protecting that those native workloads within that native environment using a combination of, of cloud hosted snaps and cloud hosted backups in an organic way. So that's kind of a flow chart that we use so that when folks say, well, I'm just going to use the cloud for data protection, this is what that kind of really kind of gets down to. And uh, this actually does fill out the chart. So if uh, the kids at home want to take a screenshot. This is probably a good one. Uh, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, I've blogged about this for years. My blog is centralizedbackup.com. You're welcome to go there and look for some other articles um, along the way. Oh, uh, thanks to our producer uh, for giving that as a larger screenshot for a second. But yeah, you can find some other articles for that as well. 
So that's the flow chart part of things. Now let's make it real, right? Dave, you mentioned we did some research on this, right? Yeah, and here's where we get to directly getting to Helen's uh, question. So we, if you're not familiar with some of the previous live streams, we conducted a very large 1500 plus organization global study around data protection in 2020. We've been sharing some of those results as we've had different topics on our streams. So let's tee up this first one. We asked about how do you envision back up this year, 2020, and then two years later from that. And you'll see it's a pretty even mix and I'm going to bring up a local copy of my end so it's a little bigger. There we go. It's a fairly even mix in terms of the different the distribution. And I always like Jason to focus on you know the edge case scenarios. So if we go right to what's not protected, that's thankfully the lowest percentage, but it's still pretty high. It's 18% are not backing up production data in the cloud today. The good news is we see obviously a great deal more at 82% of various mix of protection, but comment a little bit around that 82% mix of how things are protected in the cloud today. Yeah, so one of the things now, if you if you read the question back, so this it's a little apple and orangey as far as how we look at the trajectory from 2020 to 2022. This was 1,500 unbiased organizations, but the first question was approximately what percentage of your production data is protected by each of these. And so, yeah, it's a little alarming that one sixth of the production data is not packed up at all, right? So that's orange. I wish we could color that red, but that doesn't fit in the palette well. But um, about a third um, of customers say that they're that they protect data only on-prem, self-managed and on-prem data. So um, in that three, two, one rule, I'm kind of hoping they just didn't put tape in their equation and that's where the day is going because you got to get your data out of the building somehow. Right. Um, but then you've got on that left-hand side of that chart, basically it's about 50-50. If you're using the cloud, about 25% is self-managed using cloud-based services and 24% is, cl is using cloud services driven by a cloud provider. And that is going straight back to those first two decision questions that we had. Some folks just want cloud storage. That's the brighter green or the, the cooler green in the lower left-hand corner. And some folks really want not only the data out of the building, but they want it managed by a smarter human. And that's going to be that brighter green in the, in the BAS. Now that's the 2020 data. We asked organizations, what's going to be your primary method of data protection by 2022? So if we fill on the right-hand side, you something which I think is really exciting. Um, now this is the primary method of backup. And what you see is that bright green, which was 24% managed by a cloud provider uh, moving forward, is now 43%, nearly double. Mm -hmm. right? um, also, by the way, the self-managed but still using cloud is uh, is uh, goes from 25 up to 34%. That's a 50% increase. Uh, and then you see the self-managed only on-prem, the, the darkest green, actually reduces down to 18. And I will... If I was looking at a crystal ball, I'll mention that this research was actually finished right at the end of January of 2020, pre-COVID, right? Pre six months of sitting in your rooms and doing IT modernization in your pajamas. And so my guess is, is that that 18% that is only going to be on-prem without any cloud usage at all, I guess, my guess is that's high. Um, yeah. But what I hope folks take away is uh check my math on this 43 plus 34 so 77 percent of of organizations at a minimum um will be using cloud as part of their data protection strategy either self-managed or bas managed and i guess we should say too early to tell so it's uh 77 plus at least uh two-thirds of five uh 79 and some high change um, along that way. So really exciting that roughly four out of five organizations, the cloud is likely part of their scenario. And in a post COVID world, my guess is uh, even that's low. Dave, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think the pandemic does accelerate this. Uh, I think we're going to see for financial reasons, for availability reasons, and from really wanting to mitigate risk, risk we're going to see a rise in cloud-based activity. And it's pretty consistent with other data points that we've got from this same survey where basically all things cloud have just generated more interest and directionally meaning two years from when we initially sampled them and said, what do you believe happens in 24 months? 
every yeah. single question cloud pulled higher in its response in terms of deployment and interest compared to what's happening today. So I think you're right. I would agree that it's probably going to increase. I think the positive here is also that, you know, not backing up and not really sure if you somewhat try to equate those meaning on the left, not backing up and then unsure on the right. I like the idea that that number is getting going down directionally. That's more favorable as well. And you know, our hope would be that organizations have had some time to really consider this given global events and that we might actually see a change in behavior sooner rather than later. Now, I do want to I do want to caution folks when we talk about um, leveraging the cloud for data protection, especially in the case of backup. We're not saying it because jump people are jumping there because we're going to save money. You may not save money. That's um, right. uh, based on leveraging the cloud. The reason that data protection in the cloud is so interesting is not because it's a tape killer, because it's not, right? You should still be using tape as, a, as part of your data protection strategy, but there are some real agility capabilities that come out of having a warm data of a copy of your data that is still remote, right? If I wanna get a remote copy of my data and pull that back, if I'm gonna call the guy in the white van to come lose my tape for me and bring that back, I gotta wait a day for that, right? If I'm doing it from a cloud-based BAS offering, I can start to recover that data within minutes. And in fact, if you haven't seen the demos from Beam on, on a restore from a cloud copy, um, it's nearly as fast, assuming you have a good internet connection, which Dave doesn't, um, as if you were, um, uh, as if you're doing a local disk. I mean, it's really quick because of how granular it is on object level restore. Okay. Time check. Let's do the same thing. So we asked Helen, we told her we'd cover it in eight minutes. It's time to make sure that we make good on the promise. So this was backup. If we go to our last slide. We also did the same kind of question around BCDR. Um, it's important to recognize we talk about BCDR. It's more than just operational recovery, get a VM back up and running. DR is really around not only that survivability of data, but also the orchestration necessary to keep the business running, to keep those users productive. So we asked organizations again, approximately what percentage of your organization's protected, protected data um, is uh, 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 is BCDR capable by each of the following mechanisms? About 21% is not taken off site. And I'm okay with that. Unlike the last one, not backed up, I'm okay with not all data requires a DR copy. For some organizations, if you could go with a day or two of data loss, you might not vault that data, but that's 21% right? Uh, about a fifth. Then we see 30% completely self-manage. Um, you see 26%, I actually was uh, surprised it was that high. One in four organizations still using a hot site as part of that. And then about 23% in the upper left-hand corner using a cloud provider. If we move forward to 2022, Helen, this one's for you. Um, uh, the other half of that slide, what you'll see is that uh, cloud provider goes from 23% up to 43%. Right. Uh, uh, um, traditional hot site goes down, self-managed goes down. And and I think uh, to, to we want to talk about Draz in general, but the, the meta answer is as as cloud and hybrid becomes so much more interchangeable and intertwined with the user experience. The only things left is orchestration um, and a great service provider. And if you have those two things, all of a sudden Draz becomes really, really compelling. Um, and, and the data proves out that there's at least 1,500 other organizations that think the same way. Yeah, and I don't think we can and sort of overemphasize that shift in cloud providing. That's an 87% anticipated increase pre-pandemic polling. So I think what we really would expect is doubling that could easily be the norm, meaning going from cloud provider today to cloud provider in two years. I see Ivan's got a question. It says, which data, in your opinion, is the priority to be backed up on cloud and locally? And I'll give my answer, Jason. You know, you go ahead, please follow with yours. And my answer will sound like a cop out, but what I really think it's important is you have to almost work backwards, meaning there's no such thing as SQL Server or Oracle or whatever. You know, there's no such thing for everybody that an application is the most important thing. In fact, applications, I think where you're going with BCDR, Jason, is apps themselves don't matter. The business service matters, right? 
the application, the data, the web, you know, farm, et cetera, everything mm -hmm. that goes into providing a business function is ultimately what matters. And that's why DR and business continuity is actually broader than just data. So Ivan, my answer sounds like a cop out, but what I would say is you do a business impact analysis in the DR field. Some people you know, use that acronym BIA, but business impact analysis or business impact assessment. And you say, okay, for our organization, which processes, which business activities are the highest priority? And you try to triage, meaning what, what can't you really tolerate any downtime or minimal downtime for, all the way to what are some things where we could experience some discomfort with discontinuity but you know, it wouldn't absolutely devastate us. I think every organization has to not only answer that for themselves, but has to revisit that on a fairly regular basis because things change. What are your thoughts, Jason? Well, so, so two things, certainly um, you are exactly spot on, right? So the, the core term is this concept of a business impact analysis, which, which basically says, go back to the business operating units and understand which processes are most dependent on IT, what are the IT systems that they are individually independent or dependent on that would that would be affected if IT were to go down and work backwards from there? There's another way to answer Ivan's question, though, is if if because if the question really is around okay, what data gets backed up locally versus cloud, I would argue that that one of your questions ought to be around what is the longevity requirement for the retention of the data, and then also who is actually going to be the people that need to recover the data for. So as an example, if you're in a branch office environment, um, uh, if you're presuming the branch goes up in smoke, those users are not going to be the users that need the data. It's either corporate headquarters or another branch. So I'm of the mind these days that almost no data in a remote or branch office scenario should be stored locally. Send it to the cloud. Do not pass code. Do not collect $200. Send it to the cloud. Um, when you're talking about tactical recovery of, say, data, say, up to 30, 45 days, which is the vast majority of traditional backups, I'm good for that being on-prem. Have a small local backup server within uh, mid-sized data centers and above for those tactical backups. What I would tell you from, uh, this is somewhere between the 321 and the three kinds of media that's out there, I like data on-prem if the if the if it's the on-prem users that are going to rely on that data for upwards of 30 no more than 45 days. If the data has operational value um, uh, or data mineability, right? Data reporting, analytics, data grinding, those kinds of things. Um, or if I'm going to be using it for DR, then put it to a cloud, and that data should live in the cloud for probably up to about 24 months. And any data that you need to retain more than 24 to 36 months, I still think should go to tape, right? If you want to do long-term retention, and I would tell you that's 15, 20% of the data for most organizations, long-term retention, 10-year, 20-year, 50-year retention, send that to tape. Anything that you need agility on, data mining or DR, under 24 months, put it to cloud. Individual file level recovery, 30 days or less, run that on-prem. That's how I would uh, give that guidance for. Perfect, as we begin to wind up, I do wanna make sure we respond to, to William's question. Do you see challenges for companies learning what VMs are classified as critical or non-critical? We probably can't do that question complete justice, so maybe I'll uh, duck into comments. What I would say is VM tagging in particular, once you've got a notion of what VMs or workloads within those VMs, might be more business viable and critical than others is a good way to enforce that. In terms of defining just what is critical and not, I think you've got to go back to business impact analysis. So as we yeah, wrap up the only thing I think I would add with that is is um, Veeam does actually offer the ability to automate the cracking open of VMs as part of our data labs and integration API, so that then you could run classification tools against that and then add the tag. So in theory, we kind of spell this out for you. It takes a little bit of work, but um, you could have us back up 100 VMs. That night, we crack them open, let something else figure out what's inside of them, add some tags. And then the next day, what you'll find is 94 of those VMs now have the default policy, six of them that had PII, PCI, GDPR, whatever, and now have a different tag. And so they're then protected differently. So we enable those kinds of scenarios via the integration API and data labs. 
Fair point. So do want to point ahead to Friday, our colleague Rick Vanover is going to have a session around uh, the great content that's going to be coming in VMON 2020. Rick is going to take you through the agenda. He's been incredibly instrumental in putting all of this together and helping sort of shepherd the many different sessions. That'll be this Friday. Veeam on itself, if you haven't registered for it, is June 17th and 18th. You can see the link there at the bottom, or if you just go to the Veeam website, can also point you there. With that, we'll wind up this stream and just thank everyone for continuing to follow this. We really appreciate it. We'll look forward to getting into the comment section and stay safe, stay positive, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. See you next time.